Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering the psychosocial development of the infant. So this is actually a part two of the series for infants. So let's get started, guys. Erickson's, and that's the, um, the theorist, guys. Erickson's phase one, that's birth to one year, is concerned with acquiring a sense of trust while overcoming a sense of mistrust. So let me stop right there. Um, that infant from birth to one year, when they cry and immediately when they cry, their diaper gets changed, they're fed, they start to develop a sense of trust. But if they're crying and those needs do not get met, they start to get a sense of distrust. And this is of the environment. The trust that develops is a trust of self, of others and of the world. Infants trust that their feeding, comfort, stimulation and caring needs will be met. So this is what they're talking about when they say trust versus mistrust. Now, something important for you to know, again, guys, when does this develop the first phase, phase one? Look at this, birth to one year. If parents always meet the children's needs before the children signal their readiness, infants will never learn to uh, test their ability to control the environment. If the delay is prolonged, infants experience constant frustration and eventually mistrust others in their efforts to satisfy them. Therefore, look at this, what's the key, guys? Consistency of care is the key. Consistency. So I want to make sure that you guys understand what it's saying here. Let me make this bigger for you. The first part, look what it says here. If the parents always meet the child's demands, excuse me, needs before they signal their readiness. You're always doing that before they signal their readiness. Look at what can happen. Infants will never learn to test their abilities. And then the opposite, if they signal their readiness and parents don't do anything or they take too long to help, it causes frustration. So the key is a consistency of care. All right, let's um, go over cognitive development. Development. Remember, guys, cognition is how you think. So their cognitive development in regards to the sensory motor um, phase. This theory is actually by Piaget. That's another theorist that you have to know. So the period from birth to 24 months. So now we're going from birth to two years. That is termed the sensor motor phase and it's con uh, composed of six stages. We're gonna talk about those stages. What do you need to get from that? Number one, you have to remember that sensor motor development. You have to remember the, the theorist, which is Piaget, okay? Three crucial events take place um, during the sensor motor phase. The first event involves separation in which the infants learn to separate themselves from other objects in the environment. The second major accomplishment is achieving concept of object performance. I talked about this on the last video. You absolutely have to know this for testing, guys. Remember object permanence when something's hidden, but they still realize it's there. It didn't just disappear, okay? So the second major accomplishment is achieving concept of object permanence or realization that objects that leave the visual field still exist. An example I gave you is they have a toy and you hide it behind the couch and they go look. That means even though they can't see it, they understand that it's still there. The last major intellectual achievement and this period is the ability to use symbols or mental representation. The symbols allow the infant to think of an object or situation without actually experiencing it. Look at this. The recognition of symbols is the beginning of the understanding of time and space. So an example is if mom or dad reads the three piggies to them every night, every single night, when they see that book, they understand time for a nap, okay? This is the beginning of them starting to understand this. By the second half of the first year, so what are we talking about, guys? Six months. 
Infants can imitate sounds in simple gestures. Well, I talked about this in the last video. It was in uh, text and it was on the table. And I told you, you're gonna see it on the nursing exam. Now we're seeing it again. This is like our third or fourth time seeing that. You need to know this guys. Play becomes evident as they take pleasure in performing an act after they have mastered it. How many times have we seen object permanence? A million times. Object permanence is critical, as in essential, as in important. It is a very important component of parent-child attachment and is seen in development of separation anxiety at six to eight months of age. They just told us two things. Number one, they reminded us how important object permanence is. And number two, they reminded us that that separation anxiety starts to happen around when? Six to eight months of age. Development of body image. By the end of the first year, infants recognize that they are distinct from their parents. At the same time, they have increasing interest in their image, especially what? The mirror. We talked about this in my last video uh, the mirror, not a glass one guys, a plastic one, but the mirror is a great toy for them at that age because they're very interested in the body. So they'll look at themselves in the mirror and watch themselves move their head from left to right or smile or laugh and just see themselves doing it. Social development. By six months of age, Infants are personable. They play games such as peekaboo when their heads are hidden in a towel. Um, they signal their desire to be picked up by extending their arms. They show displeasure when a toy is removed or their faces are washed. This is another one you guys need to know by about six months. They'll let you know they don't like their face being washed. And so a lot of them, when you give them a bath, what do they do? Try to cover up their face. They don't want like their face being um, wet or submerged, okay? And that six months is great because around that age, that is really when they like to play these um, uh, uh, games such as peekaboo and you can really enjoy them. When the infant is not provided a safe haven and con look at this word guys, here it is again, consistent and loving care, an insecure attachment develops, such as infants do not feel they can trust the world in which they live. So when they cry or they show discomfort or displeasure, if their needs are addressed, they'll trust themselves, they'll trust their caregiver, they'll trust the environment. But at the same time, if the opposite happens, where they cry, their diaper doesn't get changed, they're not fed, their needs are not met, they start to um, develop a sense of distrust of their caregiver, of themselves, of the world. Two components of cognitive development are required for attachment. One, the ability to discriminate the mother from other individuals. In order for them to get that bond, that attachment to mom, they have to differentiate mom from everyone else. I recognize mom. Mom is the one that takes care of me. Mom is the one that feeds me. Mom is the one that meets my needs. Two, the achievement of object permanence. Yes, mommy left the room, but she's in the kitchen. I know she's still there. She hasn't disappeared. At approximately six months of age, infants show a distinct preference for who? The mother. They follow her more, cry when she leaves the room, enjoy playing with her more, and feels most secure in her arms. About one month after showing attachment to the mother, many infants begin attaching to other members of the family, most often the father, but it always, not always guys, but usually it begins with the mother. Infants acquire other developmental behaviors that influence the attachment process. These include differential crying, smiling, and vocalization more to the mother than anyone else. So when the infant cries, it's a cry that the mom will recognize, oh, they're just tired. Oh, they, they boo-boo, they need to get changed. Oh, they're hungry. Visual motor orientation, looking at the mother, even if she's not close. Crying when the mother leaves the room. Approaching through locomotion, such as crawling, creeping, walking towards who? The mother clinging, 
especially in the presence of a stranger. Why? Because they don't know who that stranger is. So they cling to mom because they know that mom is what? Safe. Exploring away from the mother. Look at this while using her as a secure base. So the child may crawl or creep to another location, but the whole time they're keeping their eyes on mom. And the moment they get afraid, what do they do? They creep or crawl back to mom right away. Mom is that safe place. There are two different patterns of attachment disorders. The emotionally withdrawn inhibited pattern and an indiscriminate, I can't speak, and an indiscriminate disinhibited pattern. Look how those are like two ends of the spectrum, guys. So on one side, we have um, emotionally that child is withdrawn, but look, inhibited. Where on the other side of the um, spectrum, they have indiscriminate. So that means anyone, look, disinhibited pattern. So it's on two sides of the spectrum. And again, guys, you have to remember that these are attachment disorders. These are um, things we should not be expecting to see. Infants at risk for severe attachment disorders include those who have been victims of physical or sexual abuse or neglect. Let me stop right there. You would think a child who's being abused physically or sexually, right? The person, the parent who's abusing them, you would think that always that child would like shelter themselves away from that parent and stay away from them. But sometimes you'll see the opposite end of the spectrum. One, that same person who's abusing that child, that child will be clinging to. So you, the nurse, you're suspecting abuse, but that child's clinging to the parent. That's what, that's, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, that's an attachment disorder, right? But on the opposite end, you may be a nurse, you're going into the home, you're doing home health, and you see that child is withdrawn. They're not making eye contact at all, okay? So who's, who's at risk? Children who are being abused, children who are being neglected, infants exposed to parental alcoholism, mental illness, substance abuse, infants who have experienced the absence of a consistent primary caregiver as a result of foster care, institutionalization, parental abandonment, parental incarceration, et cetera. How many times in this chapter has they stressed to us how important consistency is to that infant. Children with R, what is RAD? I hate when they do this. I don't know what this RAD stands for. Maybe I'll find it. It says children with RAD may manifest behaviors such as not being cuddly with parents, failing to seek and respond Failing to seek and respond to comfort when distressed, showing minimal social and emotional reciprocity and emotional deregulation, such as unexplained fearfulness or irritability. Give me a second, guys. I got to find what this RAS is standing for. I'm suspecting it's, such, it's some type of um, attachment disorder. I don't see it. If anyone sees it, do me a favor, go ahead, put it in the comment, but I'm sure it's some type of attachment disorder. RAS, what does that RAS stand for? But let's go over again. Children, R -A I keep saying RAS, RAD. I don't know what that R stands for, but that AD is attachment disorder. So R stands for. All right, let's go over it again. So children with something attachment disorder may manifest behaviors such as not being cuddly with parents. That should be a red flag for you as a nurse because everything that we've just gone over, that child that feels secure, that feels comforted by, comforted by the caregiver will show attachment, right? They'll be cuddly. So that should be a red flag for you when you see they're not cuddly with the parents. When they fail to seek and respond to comfort, so they're crying, they're being comforted, but they're not responding to that comfort. They're showing minimal social and emotional um, reciprocity. 
emotional deregulation, such as unexplained fearfulness or irritability. You don't see any dangers. You don't see anything wrong. Why are they showing fearfulness, especially in the presence of the caregiver where they're supposed to feel safe, where they're supposed to feel comforted? Children with autism and other pervasive developmental disorders have behaviors that are categor categorically different than those with RAD. And I'll give you guys an example. So a child with um, attachment disorder, they may not hug the parents. They may not cu uh, cuddle where, yes, I mean, children with autism, same thing. But the children with attachment disorder, they may not cuddle, but when you're speaking to them, they'll still look you in the eye. A child that has autism that's on the spectrum, when you speak to them, very often they do not look you in the eye. All right, let's talk about separation anxiety. We start to see this around four to eight months. Between four to eight months of age, infants progress through the first stage of separation individual. Look at what this says. Object permanence is developing and the infant is aware that the parent can be absent. By 11 to 12 months of age, they're able to participate um, excuse me, they're able to anticipate her imminent departure. Look at this, by watching behaviors. For example, when they see mom pick up the keys, right? They know mom's about to go somewhere. By watching her behaviors and they begin to protest before she leaves. So she hasn't even left yet, but the fact that they see her picking up her keys or the fact that they see her doing her makeup or in hair or the fact that they see her putting on her shoes, they start to protest because they understand she's about to leave, okay? We see this around when? 11 to 12 months. At this point, many parents learn to postpone alerting the child to their departure until just before leaving. So for example, they make sure that they leave the keys right before the door. So the child won't be alerted to them leaving until right before they have to go, right? Stranger fear. Between six to eight months of age, fear of strangers and stranger anxiety becomes prominent. Again, guys, I talked about this on my last video. I highly recommend that you guys make, go to a dollar store. They have like the huge, the dollar store Target. They have the huge um, index cards and you guys make cards on the development of the infant, what you expect to see at one month, two months, three months, et cetera. Language development, infants first means of verbal communication is crying. That crying is how they signal to you something's wrong because obviously they can't speak. Crying tends to decrease by 12 weeks of age. That's what, three months. During the end of the first year, infants cry for attention from fear, especially stranger, and from a frustration usually in response to developing but inadequate motor skills. So let's go over that. By the way, guys, we keep talking about infancy. Infancy is that first year of life. Birth to uh, year one, you're an infant, right? And then you go to what stage? Toddler. Toddler is like one to three. Then you go to preschool, school age, et cetera. So for right now, when I keep saying infant, I'm talking about birth to one years of age. So during the end of that first year, during the end of the infancy stage, infants cry from it for attention. If they want something or they want to play or they need to be changed or they need to be fed, whatever it is, they're going to cry or they cry from fear, especially fear strangers and from frustration. They're crying and you change your diaper, but that's really not what's wrong with them. They want a bottle. So they're going to keep crying because they're frustrated. They haven't gotten what they wanted yet. Look at this. Usually in response to their developing, but inadequate motor skills. Here's an example. Uh, infants love those motors above the, the crib. So they're on their ba back. They're looking at the motor, the colorful, the, the colors, and it's moving. It's going in a circle. And it's so interesting, right? And they want to grab it. So they try to reach up to grab it, and they can't. That's frustrating for them. 
because they want to grab it right and they are they are having developing skills where you know they're going to learn to roll over they're going to learn to crawl they're going to learn to stand and reach but they're not there yet and because they're not there yet it causes frustration for them look at this nurse alert be alert to parents reports about maternal postpartum depression and infant crying since these concerns may indicate a stressed mother infant relationship all right by nine to ten months of age they comprehend the meaning of the word no and obey simple commands, a simple command such as stop. And many times, um, you see how this says from nine to 10, they understand no, they understand. So even if you say no, they stop for a second and then they go on doing whatever it is that they wanted. The fact that they stopped for that one second lets you know that they understood what you said. They just decided to override your wishes. But by nine to 10 months, they understand no and simple commands such as stop. By one year of age, they can say three to five words with meaning. No, mama, dada. It's important that infants are exposed to expressive speech and infants with delays in achieving milestones are evaluated uh, for potential hearing loss because by nine to 10 months, they should understand no, and they should understand simple commands. So if you're not seeing that around this age where they're expected to have that milestone, you expect for um, the healthcare practitioner to write an order for an evaluation for hearing. All right, let's talk about play. Play is dependent. Pleasure is demonstrated by a quieting attitude around one month, a smile, two months, or a squeal, three months. From three to six months of age, infants show more discriminant interest in stimuli and they begin to play alone with a rattle or stuffed toy or with someone else. So what that's saying, guys, is around three to six months of age, they start showing their preferences of which toy or, or, or game they like to play or who they like to play it with. OK, by four months of age, they laugh out loud. They show a preference for certain toys and become excited when food or favorite object is brought to them. Excited by how? Clapping their hands. They recognize an image in a mirror, smile at it, and vocalize to them. By six months of age to a year, play involves sensory motor skills. Actual games such as peekaboo and pad and cake are played. I put a star next to that because that is often a test question. At six to eight months of age, they usually refuse to play with strangers. Why? They still have a fear of strangers. They actually start to develop that fear of strangers, I should say, around six to eight months of age. It's not sufficient to place a mobile over crib and toys in a play yard for a child's optimal social, emotional, and intellectual development. Likewise, the television or recorded videos, for the most part, do not, I repeat, do not provide infants with appropriate sensory stimulation. They do not increase language skills and should therefore be restricted to children younger than two years of age. It's not an it's not enough just to put toys in their playpen. And it's not recommended to have them watching TV or having too much uh, screen time. Why? For them to, for their sensory motor skills to develop, you need to be involved. When I say you, I'm talking about the parents, you're gonna be teaching that to the parents. They need to be involved in actually playing these games with the child. Look at this, play must provide interpersonal contact. You can't just put the toys in the playpen and expect them to develop on their own. They require interpersonal contact and recreational and educational stimulation. Infants need to be played with, not merely allowed to play. So you have to teach the parents that they have to be involved. Temperament anything important I want you guys to know about temperament. Mm, not really. Okay, so we're going to stop here, guys.
on the next video, part three, we'll start with coping with concerns related to normal growth and development. As always, I would really appreciate it if you let me know in the comments section what you thought about this video. If anyone figures out what that R in RAD stands for, let me know because I'm not going to go through all these pages to try to find it. But if you know it, let me know. Um, don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video. And you guys can find me on my social media platforms, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you for watching this video. And you guys will see me on the next video.